All right, what's going on, everybody? For Cryptocurrent Live, my name is Stephen Miller, and you are watching Cryptocurrent Live, the show where we bring you some of the latest and greatest in the world of crypto and help you beginners get a little bit more educated about what's going on so you can also become a little bit more Cryptocurrent. Today, I'm joined by Zeneca33, otherwise known as Roy. Roy, how you doing? I'm doing very well, very well. How are you? Doing pretty good. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've got a great show ahead for everybody. Um, we're going to be getting into a quick interview and then also talking a bit about um, Roy's brand new project, the Zen Academy Genesis Drop, um, as well as getting into um, a really nice little spin on our normal segment of Buy, seller Hodl. So let's just go ahead and dive right in real quick. Um, I'm not going to give the normal spiel that I always do, um, but Roy, for those who don't know you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you originally got into NFTs? Yeah, sure. So prior to NFTs and crypto, so basically before this year, I was a professional poker player for 15 years. So I basically went high school, dabbled at college and university and didn't stick. And then I was just doing poker in, in one form or another, whether it was online or, or live tournaments and, and that kind of stuff. And it, um, I dabbled in crypto in 2016, 2017, I think like a lot of people. And then when that bear market hit, it was just like, yeah, this is boring. <laughs> Prices stopped going up uh, back. Like I wasn't as invested in the space as I am now. I wasn't, didn't have that same conviction in, in all of it. Uh, so yeah, I think like a lot of people, it was like back to, you know, whatever you're doing before crypto. And then start of this year, sort of end of last year, as prices started going up again, a lot more people were talking about it. And and I, I still had a few coins left over from back in those days. And what, actually one of the poker sites I was playing on the current, like the currency was Bitcoin or like fractions of Bitcoin. So I was like somewhat still connected and like, I would always just transfer the Bitcoin into Australian dollars or euros or whatever. And, and just figured it was a different form of income. But as the Bitcoin price went up, I was like, let me, let me check in and see what's going on in the crypto space. And that's sort of when I first heard about NFTs, um, I had a couple of friends who had been in the space for that whole time. And they sort of started telling me about, you know, uh, crypto punks, hash masks, uh, bull run babes, I think was one of the, the more scammy sounding ones. And, and basically, yeah, I did think they were all a scam, some sort of Ponzi. I think as most people do when you first hear about NFTs and some of the prices that these uh, ostensibly JPEGs are going for, you're like, it just doesn't make sense. You can't wrap your head around it. And that that was my immediate reaction as well and, and then eventually it was like well i know that these are smart people let me just do a bit more research and and um that's when i started to to read some articles and just understand the underlying tech of nfts and like the digital ownership and, and that kind of aspect and, and i was kind of like just amazed and astounded by like what is possible and, and i made a conscious decision to like dedicate just pivot away from poker and go all in on basically crypto and nfts it wasn't nft specific then and then maybe like a month or two later it it basically became full-time nfts um in the form of like trading flipping um and then somewhere along the way creating content in the form of like i have a newsletter and then these daily stats i post on twitter um and a podcast and then it's really come full circle because then i started advising projects and like consulting and then now i've launched my own project so you know, in 10 months, I've run the whole gamut, but it's been a really fun and exciting journey for sure. Yeah. And look, for those of you at home that are um, listening to this, all of what um, Roy just mentioned with um, the podcast, which is the Two Board Apes podcast, and even his newsletter, you can find links to that in the description of this episode on YouTube, but also in the show notes when we recast this through our podcast. So just for everybody um, at home, the entire point of this, Roy, is that we're trying to get down to like demystifying NFTs and um, getting rid of some of the misconceptions that people come into it with. So I'm kind of curious, like back in your origin, like what like was there a specific aha moment that like NFTs clicked for you? Yeah, I, I can basically pinpoint it to a specific article and maybe you can link that as well in, in the description and show notes. It was... Um, by a uh, a guy called Pad, Paddy McCormick, and he writes a newsletter called Not Boring. And he had this article uh, titled The Creator, so not uh, The Creator Economy, it's called Power to the Person or Power to the People. And it's all about the creator economy. And it basically sort of outlined some of the potential use cases for NFTs beyond just a JPEG, beyond just art, and sort of thinking about how NFTs could be integrated with sort of gaming 
and gaming assets. And, you know, the gaming industry is two or three hundred billion dollars a year. Um, it's this massive industry and, and people are spending so much money on essentially digital assets that they have no ownership over. And then now because of NFT, the tech is now catching up to where you can actually own the assets that you're buying rather than the big, massive corporations, EA, Blizzard, whoever owning the assets. Now you can own it. And that that really, for me, was an aha moment. Because, well, I mean, I've spent money on games and ga gaming assets for a long time. And and it was always a case of I'm spending it and, and just I'm not really ever going to be able to get it back. It's just there. It's just like I'll enjoy the gaming asset and the game and that's it. But now it, it's sort of a situation where with NFTs, you can potentially resell it. You could potentially take it from one game to another. Um, just, again, you have ownership over it. So, yeah, I would say that was sort of the aha moment for me. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. And I think that anybody that jumps into NFTs eventually looks back and tries to find that moment. I think it's really cool that you can actually see that moment very clearly in your head. Um, but for the people that are new to it and are trying to get to that point where they're having it click over, how would you explain it to a newcomer? Like, I mean, in this space, like we call it like, you know, explaining it to a normie, but mm -hmm. I'm not trying to minimize, you know, my own audience no. here. So when you're speaking to a newcomer, like how would you explain it? Is there a way that you can get around that skepticism of buying and selling JPEGs? Um, I would say that it is, I was, to begin with, it's right to be skeptical because it is a massive shift and, and change in what we're used to. And um, if you're not skeptical, then you can easily get sort of swept up in sort of a, a scam or something, basically. It, that's, that's what happens. But um, I, I would say it takes time to, to wrap your head around it. And, and I would think beyond like the JPEGs. So like there's almost now a negative connotation between NFTs and them being quote unquote, just JPEGs, just images. Um, what you're selling is something that someone can just right click and save. And then they have the same asset. Um, it, that's what a lot of uh, people who aren't familiar with the space think of when they think of NFTs. And that's sort of become like a, a counterpoint against it. And I think that the most important thing is starting is when you can start to realize that NFTs are beyond just like just the JPEGs, just the assets. So like we, we, what started out in the NFT space, it was like just sent, selling like a JPEG or a piece of art. And then sort of collectibles came into the, the play. And, and that's when like people would release larger collections and there would be rarities and it would take like, you know, the idea of Pokemon cards or rare stamps or whatever collectibles that many of us loved basketball cards, baseball, now on the blockchain. And then that's another use case. But again, in essence, you're still just paying for a JPEG. When, when you think of other use cases, and again, going back to gaming, because it's, it's a very relatable one, and it's one that we're starting to see become more popular now, um, that's when you can kind of start to see some of the, the big picture ideas of what NFTs can be used for. Uh, I'll throw out another one is sort of like music. A lot of people understand and can relate to music and they know that many artists uh, struggle to get sort of quote unquote the royalties they deserve or the money they deserve. Like it's very difficult to get rewarded for their music. It, like A to get, you know, picked up by a label or recognized. If you're on Spotify, you get fractions of a cent per listen. Um, and, and there's this, a giant say middleman or middle people that's taking away tons of the pie. And with NFTs and blockchain technology, the the power is basically there to give a lot of that value back to the actual creators of these assets, the artists, the musicians, the, the game developers and designers. Um, and a lot of it is really just getting rid of the middleman. And I think basically no one likes the middleman except the middleman. Um, I think that's, that's a fair thing to say in life. Yeah, no, that's actually really, really accurate to the and to the point there um one of the things that i guess kind of sums it up to me is like you have to think of nfts from a business model approach right you know when you think of it as like the theirs business model you have like creators that support platforms who own revenue streams and that's like a la youtube which by the way hi youtube that's your model um but then you have a mine business model which is like the very old way of doing it like starting to get into connecting back to that the um the audience a bit better where you've got communities that support creators who own revenue streams a la patreon shopify that sort of thing but this is within nfts 
It's an hours business model where creators and communities support each other and own revenue streams together. Do you think that's kind of like the right type of mindset to have about it when you're separating it all out? I think so. Yeah. I think that's a really good, good breakdown and way to think of it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly different. And to your point, like you have to be skeptical going into it. So acknowledging that like right now, when we're recording this episode, we're in the middle of what many are calling an NFT winter. Um, and there's also like a really high level of saturation still out there. How do you go about personally, like separating the projects that are legit from both scams and also just a lackluster drop? Um, is there any advice that you'd give to a newcomer in that type of vein? Yeah, I would say, so the number one piece of advice I give to basically anyone new to the space is to be patient and, and not just jump into any old project. Like there is a lot of projects out there. Sure, some are really excellent and have great teams and visions and, and plans and the ability to execute on them. But the market is very saturated and most projects out there that are launching will probably not succeed. There probably isn't enough of a demand and market to sustain them. And so it, it can feel like you want to jump into a project like anything just because NFTs that once you get it and you start seeing other people around you making profits and showing off their NFTs, you get swept up in the FOMO, fear of missing out and you want to get involved and, and you just want to buy the next hot thing. And that's usually going to be a mistake. That's usually a mistake. If you're buying based on FOMO and just wanting to get involved, um, you end up seeing something shiny. And that's when uh, the, the projects that have very little sus substance but are just like good at marketing and saying hey we're shiny and, and new and uh you should buy us then that's when um you end up making bad decisions so first and foremost just be patient and don't feel like you need to rush into anything um and then secondly do do your research like again it's easy to get swept up in the fomo and just want to mint and want to buy something but um take your time do research and uh what that involves is is to me the number one thing is finding out uh the people behind the project the team like understanding why they're launching an nft project what they hope to get out of it um something uh my friend jamie told said to me earlier today was uh effectively the try and decide if they are they have they had an idea to build this whatever a game or this community or this vision um or platform and they, they've just decided that they can incorporate nfts into it and, and that be a really good model and rewarding them and the users and the community um that's the kind of project you want versus other people who just think hey we could launch an nft it'll probably sell out and, and make us money and then you know what can we promise people and, and what can we offer if that's the approach that's not really a project you want to get involved in you want to get involved in something where the actual nft has some integration beyond just being an nft for an nft's sake and and you you get that information by again getting back to the people talking to the team, understanding why they're launching a project, uh, what their vision is, ask them what they want to do with the money that they're raising. Because if they, if you're buying an NFT, they're getting the money, what are they going to do with it? And and if they can't answer these questions satisfactorily, then it's probably not a project that I want to get involved in. And it's really easy to ask these questions because uh, they're trying to sell something that they should and any half decent project will have say a discord community where they're active and you can go in there and you can ask questions. You can tweet at them. And again, if, if you get radio silence, if you don't hear anything back, if they're anonymous and not willing to speak to, to you, then they don't deserve your money. So do, do, do your research is, and be patient, I think. And I think what you actually just hit at the end, there was something that I've started to notice more and more lately is the, this whole idea of anonymous teams is starting to fade away because there have been so many of these types of projects that go out there with a non-docs team and all of a sudden it's a rug pull or something really sketchy happens in the background. You have a um, guy leave the project or something or other at the top, but because they're anonymous, nobody can catch it. Um, so I, I guess like would, number one, like would you agree that that is a trend that's starting to pop up more or is is it the opposite way? Yeah, I think we are starting to see more teams or more projects launching with teams that are willing to and necessarily so reveal who they are, their identities and not be anonymous because the market is wisening up to the idea that, hey, we're not going to just throw our money at anything that's minting um, and especially if it's by an anonymous team. Yeah, so again, back to that skepticism comment, right? You know, that's one of the things if you start seeing that, but everything else looks legit. That's one of the things that I would certainly stay more skeptical on. 
Um, but look, I think that when we really get down to brass tacks here, I want to get into like a almost like a practical, right? You were right now, you as you have kind of led into at the very beginning of the show, you're now advising for certain projects and consulting for certain projects. So applying what you just said about how you would go about vetting a project, what was the thing um, in a project that you're currently, actually they just passed their um, debut, um, the Curious Addies Trading Club. How, like, was there a certain thing there that kind of clicked into place that was like the linchpin that said, yes, this is a project that was worth getting into? Yeah, so again, it comes down to the team and the people behind it. I on their website, they they have pictures of themselves, uh, Ben and Mai, and they have a little bio with links to like their Twitter and I think maybe even Facebook or like some article written about them. You can read who they are, what they've worked on before, and I mean that's immediately just obviously separating them from all the anonymous teams. And and then the fact that they've had success in the past, they've been in the blockchain crypto space for many years, they have some experience. Um, that was just, you know, obviously a plus. And then I heard about the, like after the team, you want to understand the product and the, pro like what, what are they actually trying to do? Why, why are they selling you an NFT and them specifically, they're building a sort of an educational platform or an app or like a game they, they, they call it like they want to build the Duolingo, but for crypto, because there are so many people out there probably listening to this right now, some of them who want to get involved, who are interested in crypto and NFTs, but there's currently not really a great go-to place for any of us in the space to tell our friends, hey, if you want to learn about crypto, just do this. It's like it's not like you can't read one article, you can't watch one video, you can't go one place. But if you could play a game that actually teaches you and shows you a lot of the mechanics, like gives you that ex practical experience of what, say, setting your gas is on MetaMask, sending a transaction, stuff that you can't really get currently without effectively doing it in, re in the real world and then you're paying and losing money and paying expensive gas. Um, it, yeah, so the product really appealed to me. And then we had a video call and I, we chatted more and about their vision and that again, just clicked and I just get along really well with them and their vision. And um, I think that the community, like they sold out yesterday, last night, the community is starting to, or has always been very supportive and they've got this really strong community of supporters as well. So um, yeah, again, it, again, it always comes back to the people in the team and that they really stood out to me. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I personally have got a lot of love for that project. I mean, you can tell that there's actual care in the community, which is different. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times we like to sum up the NFT spaces. Like if you're going to get into it, the best projects are oftentimes the ones that really do seem different from the rest of the crowd. And mm -hmm. that was certainly one of the things that I noticed about um, Curious Addies that separated itself. But look, um, as we've now started to get into projects, I have done a little bit of a spin on a normal segment that we do here called Buy, Sell, or HODL, where we break down the biggest news stories of the week and determine whether or not they're bullish or bearish. And in this spun out version, I figured that we kind of make a game of it. So um, are you up for that? Absolutely. Perfect. In that case, let's jump in to Buy, Sell, or HODL. Buy, buy sell, 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 or HODL. HODL. All right. And so for those of you that, again, are new here, um, this is not our traditional version of buy, sell or hodl. This is a little bit different. So as you see up on screen right now, we've got three specific instances of um, different categories in the NFT space. And from your perspective, Roy, I'm curious, as you see collectibles, breaking it down into like profile pictures and avatars, and then art, both the generative and, and the analog side. And then, of course, what we've been hearing a ton about lately, thanks to you know new, the new form of Facebook, uh, metaverse property. If you could attach a buy to one of these, a sell to one of these, and a hodl to one of these, and you had to choose for each of them, which would you put on these categories for those that are trying to break in? So am I, sorry, is it, I say buy, sell, or hodl to each individual one in the category or like buy, sell, or hodl each category? Buy, sell, or hodl for the category for this one. We're oh, gonna, okay. I'm going to give you individual um, projects in the next couple. But yeah. I, I figured that we would start out a little bit broader so that people could get an understanding of like these categories and where the opportunity may be right now. 
Yeah, I would say sell collectibles and advertise items just because the market is saturated. Um, yes, some of the blue chips will do well um, and the, some of the established projects will do well, but I think as a whole, it's just unsustainable, the, the, the just the quantity of projects that are out there. Um, so I've got what, buy and hodl left. I would... I, Right now, I would probably buy art and, and hodl metaverse property. I think that if you asked me a month ago, it would probably be the reverse, but we've already seen a massive pump in metaverse um, assets over the last month or couple of weeks or however long it's been since the Facebook announcement. A lot of money has already flowed into the pay, into the space so that those prices are probably a little inflated, whereas art and, and art NFTs, they, they've been going through a pretty significant bear market lately. And just generally the the Warren Buffett quote of you want to buy when others are uh, fearful and sell when others are greedy. Currently, I think people are fearful in the art market and greedy in the metaverse stuff because, you know, that's where all the hype and attention is. So uh, buy art, hodl, metaverse. Yeah. Yeah, I would actually totally agree with you on that. And as I've kind of watched in the art block space, I think and I think that of course, you follow this very closely with art blocks. A lot of those projects have been taking very unique hits lately. And I think that probably comes more on the heels of the fact that they've now subdivided on OpenSea each mm -hmm. individual project. But the timing of it's key, right? I think there's a lot of opportunity in there. So I would agree with you um, in the exact way that you laid it out. So let's dive into the next one. The next one on here is the projects that are currently in the public lexicon, the things that, you know, the every man would know about, you know, if you're walking mm -hmm. down the street and you ask people about NFTs, eventually the person that has some exposure to it will say, oh yeah, like CryptoPunks and Bored Apes. Mm -hmm. So these are three projects that I've identified, CryptoPunks, Bored Ape Yacht Club and everything in that ecosystem, including, including mutants and um, the Kennel Club. Mm -hmm. And then finally V Friends. If you had to attach buy, sell or hodl to these three, how would you rank it out? Wow, that's that's tougher. Um, I figured it would be because I, I know that you're still um, very embedded in Bored Apes and you still really, really want a CryptoPunk from what I've heard. Yeah, and I have a V-Friend and, and I'm bullish on them long term as well. I think, um, Jesus. So I got to oh, sell yeah. one of these. That's tough. Um, so let's let's go ahead and just put this out there while you're thinking about it. This is no disrespect to any of these projects. They're all three phenomenal projects. Yeah, exactly. Is, I don't want to just, sell any of them. Yeah, this is just a practical thing of like looking at opportunity across the market. We just want to give the newcomer an understanding of like, okay, through an expert's eyes, how would they think about breaking this down? So I would... Uh... <laughs> how, how about that tough? How about this? If it's going to irk you that bad that you don't want to say sell, you can attach HODL to two of them. Okay. Um, well, no, I'll, I'll go ahead with it. I, I'll sell a CryptoPunk um, just because of the fact that it is a lot harder for a CryptoPunk. I'm assuming that we'll say we buy a floor one of each. It's a lot harder for that to go up, say, 10x in value compared to the other two just because it's got a much higher floor price. So for that fact alone, I would like you could sell a CryptoPunk and buy, I don't know, like eight, nine, 10 V friends. And I think that from a purely investment point of view, it's a lot more likely for a V friend to go from eight ETH to 80 ETH than for a punk to go from a hundred ETH to a thousand ETH or, or whatever. So yeah, we'll sell a punk and then, um, hodl V friends. I think they're a good long-term hold. And then I would buy something in the board ape universe. I think that there's a lot of, Momentum still going for them. They 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 had a great showing at NFT NYC. Uh, I mean, they they just they had. Did you see the big news today that they had four apes are getting uh they becoming a band and UMG Universal Music yeah. basically is working with them to to create this band and sign them and um like Jimmy Kimmel ha mentioned he had an ape last night. It's just apes are not going to slow down. So I would I would they they had potential their tokens coming out next year. It's like yeah, like I am. I, I really want a crypto punk still and I'm very bullish on V friends, but apes, I guess I just got to be more bullish on. Yeah. And look, I respect that. And frankly, that news on the apes today was wild. Yeah. Uh, I, I would have number one, never seen that coming. Like I thought that we were going to ramp up to that maybe eventually, mm -hmm. but 
I thought that like the ceiling of the engagement with agencies right now was going to be maybe like stuff with Jenkins, the valet, like that mm -hmm. was probably going to be the type of tier that we'd get to in this cycle, but nope. Now we got a, a band of apes. So yeah. Um, and like, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Nuts. It's nuts. Yeah. Like you wouldn't have expected it um, no. from a mile away. Uh, but I also love the fact that you're hodling on V friends. Cause to me, it's like anything that Gary V touches turns to gold. You know, yeah, I'm such a big fan of his. Yeah, I, I think they're going to go very, very far. And if you're not aware of this at home and you're, again, wanting to get in, into some of these projects, but are sitting here looking at the screen, if you've joined us on YouTube and you're seeing a price floor of 8.2 ETH for V friends, which is equivalent to about $39,000 US, that is totally unattainable, right? Like, the, again, these projects are in the public eye for a reason because the in a lot of cases, the price has brought them into mm -hmm. the public eye. But for v friends, v friends in particular, they're rolling out a series too soon. So in theory, it's going to have a new entry point for people to jump on board. So just that's really cool. I didn't know that actually. Yeah, they uh, they announced that. I want to say either just before NFT NYC or at NFT NYC, but that should nice. be coming here in the I think Q1 of 2022. So keep an eye out for that for sure. But let's dive into the next one. The first of our art blocks um, trios that we have here is kind of like the more high roller segment. And now, Roy, no, um, not trying to like, I guess, point it out too much so, but Roy is deeply embedded within art blocks. He loves art blocks. And in a lot of cases here, I imagine that this first one is like, going to really tug at your heartstrings because I know that you have a <laughs> lot of love um, for Fragments of an Infinite Field. Yeah. But, um, this is, I kind of identify High Roller as like, okay, these price floors are somewhat attainable if like you have a sum of money that you want to bring in and you kind of are willing to act with conviction in getting into NFTs. So when you see these three specifically, Fragments of an Infinite Field by Monica Rizzoli, um, Singularity by Hideki Tsukamoto, and um, the blocks of art by uh, Schwembilder, I think it was. Is that is that the? I think that's rough, how you pronounce it. Yeah, a rough estimation on it. Um, yeah. Well, how how would how would you attach um, buy seller huddle here? Huh. It's it's whew, it's tough and interesting. I would, I guess, sell Singularity. Um, I am a fan of them, but personally, they they they've not been one of my like most favorite art blocks collections um, or curated collections. And I would also say that the um, Hide Hideki, the artist has been releasing work elsewhere um, off art blocks, which also looks phenomenal. Um, but to some extent is, is a little similar to the singularity look. And I think that, yeah, I mean, look, they, they're great. I like them, but it, if I had to pick between these three, I would sell that. Um, I would huddle the blocks of art. I think I I was always a fan of the project. It was one of the first projects I was I actually minted and was really ha happy about. Um, and then the fact that Schwembelder, the artist, has sort of built in a utility aspect to the project um, and, and the blocks of art. He's created this club where if you collect enough of them or some of his other pieces then you get like all sorts of utility benefits in the terms of free in in the term in the ways of free drops and stuff like that um but probably arguably more importantly some of the biggest holders of the blocks of art are enormous whales in the space so like vincent vando is a massive collector he has a ton of the blocks of art and things from the cheven builder collection and something that i i think and talk about quite a bit is that from like if we're talking about from an investment point of view taking art out of the separate uh this uh, equation now uh you want to sort of try and, if you can, align your incentives with that of influential whales or just people who have influence and, and who also want to see the project succeed. So it, it's like, for starters, they're just not going to just dump their entire supply and undercut the floor in the immediate term. But also, they're, they're, if I'm going to use Vincent Mando as another as the example still, he has been gaining a massive Twitter following. He has been working with three arrows capital and they've created a DAO and a, a starry night fund and they're just working to bring nft art more mainstream and more into the forefront and he has a ton of these so he is probably at some point going to be talking about the project in a positive way and that's just a good thing to hold on to um and fragments of an infinite field i would buy because i love the project it looks great i want to hang it on my wall um 
And I, I think that at the current prices, they're probably going to do like they're down, you know, 70, 80 percent from their all time highs. Probably a good buy. Um, and I love them. Yeah, I, look, I struggle with the sell on the hodl on this one, but my buy is exactly where you said. But that's because for me, I don't have the capital to put into a um, fragments of an infinite in a, uh, an infinite field. Great to be able to have so many F's in that um, title. Mm. But um, to me, that's like that's a that's a grail type of project to me. I would I would love to be able to buy one of those at some point. Um, so definitely worth keeping your eye on, especially if you are a high roller looking to move into art blocks. Um, but let's go ahead and jump to our final one, which is art blocks for the true newcomer. And I say newcomer again, this is still a lot of money we're talking about here for somebody who's just jumping into NFTs. But I think that if you're looking for an attainable price for something that has high upside, these are three projects, in my opinion, that would be good to look at just for entry point. So these three projects are Edifice by Ben Kovach, who is brand new. This is the most recent curated drop on our blocks. Algorithms by Han and Nicholas Daniel. And then last but not least, Sculpture or Sculptor, um, depending on how you want to pronounce it, by Peter Pasma. Now, I have a, a ton of love for all of these because they're so incredibly different from one another. Um, but I'm curious to hear your take on it. What, how would you go about evaluating this uh, for buy, seller, huddle? Yeah, I mean, I love all these projects too. I think they're all unique and as you said, different to one another. Um, Sculptor is incredible. Like It's this 3D rendered high quality image that was written with like a minuscule amount of code and just is from a technical point of view it's magnificent from a visual point of view it's unlike anything else in art blocks um damn it's it's crazy that the prices uh at least for that is so low i think um and to and just so that the audience is clear like this is like literally the prices today so mm -hmm. um just for perspective on where we are in the market um edifice the price floor right now is 2.29 this is just because I have, I have to I have to say all this yeah. because we recast this on our podcast. Um, algorithms price floor right now is two ETH, which is disrespectful in my opinion. And sculpture is at two point four three. Um, so all of them are in that two to three range. Yeah, um, I love edifice, but I guess if I had to, I would sell that. Um, Whew, that's tough. Um, yeah, I mean, purely from an investment point of view, I would sell it. If it's from an art and loving the art, I would probably not sell it. But let, let's go from more of an investment point of view um, because art is subjective and people may not agree. I think, yeah, it's the most recent drop. It has a collection size of almost 1,000. Uh, it's roughly at mint price. It minted out at 2.4 in a Dutch auction, plus gas. It was a little higher. Um so I, I could see it dropping some more still. Um, it'll probably do fine and well and great in the long run. I think I'm obviously bullish on Artblocks long term. But yeah, so I would sell that. I would hold Sculptor. I I don't want to sell it because like it's probably at all-time lows for floor price now. I, I think it's a really unique, magnificent project. Um, and Edifice is kind of unique as well, but you can kind of see similarities to even Fidenza's and Meridian and a couple of other Artblox projects in there in the in a way that with Sculptor, it's just nothing else is like it on Artblox and perhaps on in generative art on the blockchain, generative art NFTs. It's very unique, very special, and I think it's, it's a good hold. And I would buy Algorithms because, again, it was one of my first fav most favorite projects. I minted one or two. Um, I love the audio visual aspect of it. Um, and also importantly, I, I will, for two important reasons. One, it was early enough on in art blocks that it's like in series two or three. So for those who care in the future about, um, being early and the, the historical value in the earlier projects, it has some value there, but probably more importantly is the collection size for, uh, is it 500 or a thousand? I can't remember. I, I th hmm. Yeah. I think it was in my head. In my head, it's 500. It's possible it's 1,000. Um, but let's go with 500. And for that reason, it's just a good buy from supply and demand perspective. But um, I, I do just, I love them. I have a few. I, I'm really waiting for some great digital displays where I can have them and just like have it so you can touch the display and then it plays the music and the tune. And um, yeah, so I, I would love to buy another one. Yeah, so 
for those um, that aren't totally familiar with this, um, the first one, Edifice, is... I don't know if the right term is animated, but it's dynamic, so it actually evolves over time. Mm -hmm. um, so is sculpture to a degree. Um, and then with algorithms, it is animated, but it also has music to it. Um, that's one of the components that's kind of missing from this little snapshot that you have on screen. But I completely agree with your assessment on algorithms. Like it is such a phenomenal thing to see mm -hmm. and experience. Like if you can go up on OpenSea later, search algorithms, um, click in and actually open up one of the pieces and let it play through. The fact that that is generated by a computer just blows my mind. Yeah, it really is is special. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, very, I appreciate you. I appreciate you playing along with me for buy, seller, hodl this week. Um, again, for those of you at home that are just joining us for the first time, if you want to see what buy, seller, hodl normally is like on this show, please feel free to join us. We do these streams every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. We would love to have you back. Um, so let's go ahead and move forward here. I'll take the screen back down. Um, have a couple other questions for you, um, more in line with your recent drop. Um, so if you could tell me a little bit about the Zen Academy and what you envisioned for this drop, um, especially now that it's in its Genesis phase. Very quickly before that, I just checked it was a thousand for algorithms. <laughs> so that the whole reasoning goes out the door, but I needed to check anyway, uh, Zen Academy. So yeah, several months ago, I, sort of had this idea kind of similar to what curious Addies is doing but i was like i was creating content my newsletter and stuff and i like getting a ton of questions every day from people into the space either from the very beginning or even more advanced and wanting just to ask questions and get information and i was like why isn't there a really good educational platform yet for nfts why don't i i build it i could start it um and I started getting very excited and had all these ideas. And I was like, I have a website and I could have guides and courses and all this kind of stuff. And very much getting ahead of myself. And very quickly, I, well, not very quickly, but maybe after like a month, I realized this is just going to be too big of a beast to tackle. I would need, for starters, like lawyers and, and people to figure out the logistics of the company. I would need a fully fledged website. I would need probably other content creators working to help create some of the stuff. And then I was like, yeah, no, I, I don't really want to do that because... I'm not about that life right now. And I was happy to continue sort of trading NFTs and creating my newsletter and content and podcasts and that. And then fast forward to maybe two months ago, I, I was planning to go to America for an Art Blocks event in Marfa and then Ape Fest and NFT NYC. But because of like a travel ban due to COVID, uh, no one from Europe or at least in Germany could travel if they'd spent the previous 14 days here. And so basically I realized, hey, my next six weeks are now relatively free. Maybe I could revisit Zen Academy. And I sort of went back to the drawing board. And by this point, I had a Discord server that had several thousand people in it. And sort of we already had this community going. And I was like, well, this is awesome. What can I do to take this to the next level, basically? And I've been creating content for a while and you know, I, I had people reach out to me to like advertise, had people saying you can make your newsletter paid. I'd pay happily pay $10 a month for it. And, you know, though I'm a fan of free information and having things out there for people who want to learn easy access and, and all of that. So none of those options really appealed to me. Um, but I thought that if I could release an NFT that acted as sort of like a membership token to what I was calling Zen Academy, an educational platform, um, it could be a way for those who wanted to be a part of like something larger to buy the token, support me, support the Academy, and hopefully potentially get some value and rewards in return. And that's basically where I ended up with this, this idea that I would make my discord sort of quote unquote private or gated. Um, actually originally the idea was to have the discord fully free and public and just have like one or two special channels in there for NFT holders. But um, we ended up, Basically, we had some bots and we had people getting scammed and there were issues with fully free and public Discord server. And then as, as it scales and grows, it gets more difficult to sort of keep the riffraff out, so to speak, or just the, the, the bad actors out. Um, so having a small paywall, in effect, helps in, on that front. So yeah, I, I was like, hey, let me just create an NFT, access to Discord. Um, you know, we have a great community. You can join and have lifetime access with the NFT. 
I, I already I gave anyone who was already in the Discord like a role so they already have lifetime access so they don't have to buy to stay. And then uh yeah, we launched it a couple of days ago. The price I think is is quite reasonable. It's still open for sale. Uh point oh three three ETH, so hundred and fifty dollars, let's say, depending on the price. Um for basically lifetime access to Zen Academy, which is currently it's basically just a Discord server and me th in there in a community, but it, it's hopefully going to grow into something bigger. I don't know what what direction it's going to take or what what it's going to end up being, but um, yeah. So so that was the majority of the launch. I had a separate option, so uh, there was basically two NFTs you could buy. There was this one, 0.033 Lifetime Genesis membership, and then a much much more expensive option at 3.33 ETH. Uh, and this one was primarily targeted towards people who were looking to launch their own project. So people, um, I had been advising and consulting with projects for the last couple of months or six weeks maybe. And there was just far more people wanting to get advice and, and con con consulting services on their project that they were launching than I could reasonably figure out a way to deal with I, I was i was happy to talk to some people for free and, and still am but at a point when i'm getting like 15 or 20 people a day asking for 15 or 20 minutes of my time it's just not feasible to to continue in that way um and so i, I figured instead of having full-on advisory deals with with projects where i get a percentage of the sale revenue or something perhaps we can use this web3 model with an nft access to a different private discord with other people who are launching projects maybe they can help one another out i will be there we can have calls and discussions and help in that respect um yeah so those are the two nfts i'm selling uh, we launched a couple of days ago and i'm i'm excited for everything really it, it's been going well smooth and uh, slow and steady sales the community is growing uh, i'm really happy about it um oh let me mention one other thing uh i also set up a role where uh so people can join the discord and get like read only access for free so you know Again, not not necessarily to gate the community to the public, but sort of to protect it from bots and scammers and people posting malicious links. If you just want to be a fly on the wall, you can fill out a Google form, join the Discord, and you'll, one of the mods will give you a role, and then you'll be able to just view the content for free, but you won't be able to participate. Yeah, and if there is one word of like encouragement that I can give to our audience, this is definitely one Discord server that you want to be in. Um, I personally have been in the uh, Zen Academy Discord now for goodness i would call it months but i'm yeah <laughs> time I'm is terrible. weird yeah i mean in especially in nft land right like we've mm -hmm. we've come to understand that you know being in it for as long i mean look you've been in it longer than i have but even in being in it as long as i have a month in nft land is like years so mm -hmm. um time is relative it's construct as hannibal burris would say but um at large you want to be in a, a community like this it's I mean, Roy gives a lot of love back to his community. He really does put a lot of thought into everything that he contributes to it. Um, so, and that's like very apparent in the way that you've structured it. So I thank you for that as a uh, member of the community, but at large, there's a ton that you can learn in here. So it's a great resource, especially if you want to learn more about NFTs or even just talk to people that are like-minded in that. So um, back to the point outside of me endorsing um, your Discord <laughs> server and getting your hands on a Zen Academy NFT. Um, from your experience now having developed and released your own NFT, did you find it over overwhelmingly challenging or did you find that like it was something that with a bit of patience, like you can truly roll out um, reasonably speaking, like if you don't necessarily have a ton of technical background? Yeah, so it was, I never felt overwhelmed. I felt like, I definitely felt a little terrified like with the prospect because I don't have that much technical knowledge. So if you don't, then basically you need to work with a, a dev team or a couple, one con, like a coder who can read and write Solidity smart contracts. And I was very fortunate that I met, going back to Curious Addies again, the, the co-founders, Ben and Mai, um, at a time when I was just about to launch this project. And previously I had been working with another platform who like a, a company that deals and specializes in launching projects. And, you know, th they seemed very competent and, and they were like, yes, we're going to test, we'll write a contract, we'll do everything, uh, and we'll charge you 15% of your sale revenue. And that was kind of relatively standard. I spoke to other people and the rates were really 10 to 30%. And then Ben and Mai were like, hey, we'll do it for free. <laughs> and then um, 
it it was amazing to find that, but also, uh, again, it, whoever you go with, you, you kind of have to trust that they know what they're doing because if you don't have the technical know how, you can't yourself. And again, it's sort of a trust but a verify. You get one person or one team to write the smart contracts, and then you try and get it audited and show it to a few other people just to double and triple and quadruple check that it's right and there's not then there's not going to be some loophole for them to steal your money or something like that so it's a little terrifying if you don't have the the technical know-how and i definitely learned a bit and learned a bit of how to read solidity code and i definitely recommend doing a bit of that that work if you are going to launch a project yourself um and actually when when if you are launching a project you like i actually launched it myself so like i deployed the smart contract to the ethereum blockchain um because the the person or the wallet that does that is the one that has actual ownership of it. So you want it to be the person whose project it is like mine, um, because that means that I have control of the money in there. I have the ability to pause the contract. I have the ability to, you know, I just have control over it. And you don't want your devs, even if you trust them, you just, you want it to be yours. And so, you know, you have someone walk you through the steps of that, like I did. And uh, it, it is a little terrifying, but it's exciting. And you learn a lot. I learned a lot in the process. Um, I wouldn't say it was overwhelming, but my launch is relatively simple compared to some of the other ones, like the a 10K project with generative art with different rarities. Uh, like it, it adds moving parts and complexity and, and difficulties um, in a way that mine doesn't. Like my NFTs, they're, um, each NFT is basically a token that looks the same. It's just like a, a letter that I wrote, but it's not like there's no rarities involved. There's no collectible aspect. It's, it's easier. Um, but yeah, I, I learned a lot and I would recommend anyone that is thinking of launching a project um, to do it. To Like you can learn a lot in the process and just to like, it's not that it's not. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, there's a lot to be unpacked, at least from that alone. So if you at home are interested in this, like, please feel free to rewind and you know play that back again. But in the world of you know, ERC 721s and 1155s and everything else that is the NFT world right now. Um, Roy's project was an ERC 1155. It, and it really is just an open, it can be an open edition, it can be a closed edition, but it is the replicated token repeated a certain iterative number of times. In a 721 contract, like you've probably seen with Bored Apes and all these 10,000 avatar projects, it's that each one is unique from each other. Um, so just to give a little bit of context there, um, for those that aren't totally familiar with it, but when you think of the, I mean, you, now that you've had the experience, would you do anything different? Like if you could go back and tweak some things, have you thought about that much? Granted, I know that Zen Academy went live like 24 hours ago, right? <laughs> um, 48, actually it's, it's been two days now. It's just crazy. I, there's one thing I would do different for the most part. It went really smoothly and I was very happy with it. Um, for the higher priced membership, the 3.33 ETH one, the drop process was via a whitelist. So we weren't going to have a public sale and we would just sell to people on a whitelist. And the application process was basically, I created a Google form anyone that was interested in applying basically if they're launching a project or if they just wanted to be in this community for whatever other reasons, fill out the form, verify that you want to pay because you understand that it's, it's this expensive and you know, what I'm offering is not anything really tangible. It's like advice, consulting services, access to discord, that kind of thing. Um, if you're interested in that and you're willing to pay, then great. Fill out the form, put your ETH address, we'll put you on a whitelist. And then I basically got like 1500 responses to this Google form. And so that was a lot and overwhelming. And um, <laughs> maybe that part was overwhelming. It was, it, that was a lot of, lot of responses. And I, I literally went through every single one and I ended up picking like five or 600 and then randomized to, to pick out like 320 that we were giving away for, for whitelist spots. Um, and then when we went live, I, I, a couple of days before we went live, I published a Google doc with the list of the Ethereum addresses. So I'm like, hey, if your address is on this, you're on the whitelist. And then when we went live, I just posted the same document and said, great, you're there, you can mint. What I should have done is uh, because there was probably about a month or three weeks between when I first published the form and went live, I should have either myself or had some, uh, some of my employees reach out to 
the people on the list just to verify that they were still interested because a the market had changed the landscape had changed your prices of eth had gone up gas has gone up there was a bear market people are less liquid um perhaps if they were launching a project then they may not want this now a month later um and i, I should have just verified whether they were still interested or not because i ended up after the launch realizing that not not a lot was selling and then i i myself went through and dm'd everyone on that list and i've been receiving a lot of replies from people saying you know, change my mind for this reason or that reason. Um, some are saying they'll want, they'll mint on the weekend, etc. But it would have been better to do that in advance, and then I could have given their spots over to other people potentially on the whitelist. Whereas now it's a, it's a, it's a case of all right, so people I have to remove their addresses from the list and then go back to the the Google spreadsheet after the form results, find other people who applied, message them, see if they're interested, and it's 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 an ongoing process. I mean, I say that I would have done it differently, but on the flip side, it's kind of nice to have this slow and steady influx of people to that membership because if, if all of a sudden there was, let's say it just sold out and there were 300 people in the Discord, obviously from a financial perspective, it's a success and I would have been happy from that, but it would have been overwhelming trying to like devote the amount of time and attention I would feel like. I ought to, to the Discord and to everyone um, with that many people, even with 100. So like we've sold out like 20. We have 30 people in Discord because there were some giveaways. Um, and, you know, there's been five, no, actually 15 a day, I guess. If it's only been two days, but time is weird. Um, th there's been this, this nice trick, uh, trickle of people coming in and um, the community is sort of building nice and organically. And I, yeah, I actually wouldn't say if I would change it or not, but um that's the only thing where I had the thought to, to think I might have done that differently. Yeah, I mean, look, reflections, everything. And I'm sure that like after a couple more weeks of this, like you'll probably think of a couple other things. Um, but it's, al it's always very interesting to hear like, you know, what you took away, even in just like the immediate aftermath, it'll always evolve. Um, but mm -hmm. look, that there's a tremendous amount that you can get from, again, getting your own Zen Academy NFT at home. Um, of course, Roy, you've got resources up in the um, Zen Academy server listed, um, and I will do my best to share some of those resources back into my own community so that people here at CryptoCurrent are getting um, access to, at the very least, resources that may help you on your educational journey. So check the show notes and the episode description here on YouTube. Um, I'll do my best to link as many as I can. But outside of that, um, just as we're coming up to time here, I wanted to ask one final question to you, um, and it's again a little bit more data driven and like looking at the at the finality of where we're at in the market. Are there any new or old projects right now that have caught your eye during the down market? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the blue chips are very very appealing. So, like, I would say mutant apes are they seem like a good buy. Um, New projects, I wouldn't say, I mean, Curious Addies, obviously, I've, I'm very supportive of that project, not just because I'm an advisor, but because I believe in what they're doing, and they have a really strong team. So, so that's caught my attention. I think an older project that I think has gone under the radar a lot, which I've, again, spoken about and talked about and written about is Top Dog Beach Club. And again, because they have an exceptional team working on it, I really believe that they will do everything in their power to create an excellent product. They've already created an excellent product, a thriving community. And yeah, it, th their floor price is quote unquote relatively low. It's like 0.12 or something. Um, they minted out at 0.08. So it's <laughs> only a 50% increase um, from mint in a few months. But, um, you know, after you include gas and all that, it's not like people that minted have made a significant profit, especially in the NFT space when projects are going 10, 100 X. Um, but you know, the, the team is still there killing it and doing a great job. And I have a lot of love for, for them and their project. And that's something that I, I would probably want to pick up in, in this bear market. And then just tons of art block stuff is just looking very, very appealing at the moment because they're down 80%, 90% in some cases. Yeah. And again, I, I would definitely take a look at art blocks, um, for those that are interested at home. Um, I find it really funny because there's been another dog project that we've actually, um, had onto this channel before and um, have continued to kind of feature here and there that almost is following top dog beach club to a T um, <laughs> in, ter in terms of its price floor and like having a really solid team and everything else. But um, it's just interesting. I mean, a, a cat project wouldn't have this type of problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, 
Um, I got one last quick segment for everybody before we call it a day here. So if you'll stick with me for a minute, Roy, um, this is what to watch for. What to watch for. So in the week ahead, there are a couple of things that you should be aware of. On November the 15th, Bitcoin is upgrading to Taproot. It's the first major upgrade since SegWit. Um, if you are a Bitcoin fan or are just interested in learning more about Taproot, we may talk about that on Tuesday's live episode of Cryptocurrent Live. But also on the 16th, Elrond, which is another uh, ecosystem play, is officially launching the Maillard Dex. So that is going to be their mechanism for exchanging assets on the Elrond protocol. Um, of course, now that we've come to the end of it, and that is all that you have to watch for in the next week, at least from us, um, Roy, again, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us, man. It was great having this chat with you. Um, seriously, it was a lot of fun. So thank you for that. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed myself. Great. And it, again, for those at home that are looking for links to get in, um, you know, connected with Roy and following Zeneca33 on Twitter, of course, you can follow him at his handle on screen, but we will also have links to everything that he's involved with in the show notes. So everything from the newsletter to uh, to Board Apes and even the Discord server you can find there. But last notes for us before we call it a day. Um, this past Monday, we had Alex Smirnov from DeBridge do an interview with Richard. It was a really good one. Hope that you've paid attention to it. Uh, yesterday, Chris did a really interesting segment on staking and thought he was really clever and put a stake on the thumbnail. Um, and then, of course, tomorrow we have another interview um, with Richard sitting down with Tim Gl Tim Glover from Chronicle, which is an authenticated NFTs play that's rewarding holders of authenticated NFTs. So that should be a very interesting episode of the Cryptocurrent podcast. But again, that's just about going to do it for us here. Of course, if you're new here, please feel free to like and subscribe. We would love to hear from you. Please hop into the comments. Let us know what you thought of this episode. And of course, do us all a favor. Stay Cryptocurrent. We'll see you next time.